My name is Ryan Dahl. I'm a web architect for VML, uh, same company that David Mitchell works for who just gave us a great talk on code reviews. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about interviewing developers. And I myself have been a developer for well over 10 years now. So watch out for that, Cord. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, how many people here actually partake in any interviewing for their company as far as developers? <laughs> All right, actually, pr pretty good amount. How many of you think it's important that a developer is in the interview process with other developers? Nobody else, come on. Yeah, it's key. So when you're trying to find the best talent for your company, you need someone technical in these interviews. So most companies use just your HR only. They'll probably have some influence from dev or tech inside, these, uh, inside the interviews themselves. But mainly the lucky thing about VML, which I work, I'm gonna go into a little bit more about our company here in a minute, is that we have the opportunity to work with contracting firms. So I actually get to part, partake in the actual interview process for a majority of all front-end developers that come inside VML. So I'm gonna cover a few quick things about today. Uh, real quick. Some of the main things are, the most important thing I want you to take away if you have to leave early is that you're a salesperson for your company. I will get into some tech stuff, so don't worry. There is some tech things, but you're a salesperson. Some people think the first thing you're going to do in an interview is like, I got to make sure this candidate is the most valid candidate to come in. That, I honestly think, is secondary. The first thing is, is that you're a salesperson to sell your company in the interview process. Why? Because right now, the way the market is, you have a lot of opportunities for developers that can go someplace else other than your company to work for another place. So you have to sell it to them. It sounds weird, and that might not be the most comfortable thing that you're used to, but you need to be available to talk about your company, how great it is, and why they should come work for you. Some people, like I said, are not comfortable with that. We'll go into that a little bit later. The other thing is to, the four main things I wanna cover. Prep work, before the interview, selling your company. Obviously, I just talked about interview questions and post-interview work. Yes, there is work you should do after the interview about the candidate that you just interviewed. Some people just like to blow that off, but there's a lot of work that still needs to happen. First thing, I want to say a legal disclaimer. If you are going to do an interview, you probably need to touch base with your HR department for your company and make sure there's questions that you, sh you should not ask during interviews. I'm not going to go into those. There's a whole nest of things you should not ask candidates, age discrimination, sex discrimination, any of that stuff. You need to make sure that you know that stuff down pat. I'm not covering that today because we're going to talk about more of the tech and more of the selling stuff. So before you go into any interview, make sure you know the rules of an interview and you don't violate anything during the interview process. All right, prep work. Main thing about prep work is, the first thing you need to always look at is get specific questions from this candidate's resume. You now have a list of where they've worked over the last three or four years. Look through it. I am, I am victim of, I've actually got a resume in my hand and I didn't look at time and my golly, I have, a re, I have an interview here in five minutes. So what do I do? I trump off to that interview and I haven't looked through their resume very much. So I don't know what to ask them. That's horrible. I admit I've done it. But this, the other side is you need to block off at least 30 minutes before you do an interview to actually start reading through the resume, start taking notes on what you should be asking this person questions for, especially technology inter, uh, tech interview, like developers. Look through, look what languages they know. This is kind of obvious, this one's not too hard, but you should be looking through the resume. Don't blow it off and don't just wait till the last minute to look through it. Know before you go into the interview. Um, second thing is have general questions that all candidates ask. You want to make your interviews fair to all the different candidates that come in. Have a list of tech questions. I'll go into some more specific tech questions later, but general questions for all the candidates to answer, so they're all kind of in the same level playing field. So when they come out of the interview process, you, get, you got to gauge certain key aspects for every one of your candidates. Third thing, have two people in the interview. I like to call this good cop, bad cop, but not necessarily. They're both good cop. Uh, I keep thinking of the Lego movie with the good cop and then the bad cop spinning around, so think of it as that way. But you need to have a salesman and a technician. Salesman, that's someone who's gonna know the facts about your company and is very easy to talk to people about why your company is the best, why your development practices at VML, for my company, VML is the best, why we use other languages or why we're the best in this field. We do meetups, we do all these social things outside of it. They need to have the kind of the sales thing done. If you're not comfortable with that and you're more of a technician and you like to get inside the interview process and you like to really get into the nuts and bolts of what they know, that's fine. Be the technician during the interview, but still have someone else there that's a salesperson. I mean, and, but they should know some tech a little bit as well. When it comes to the interviews I give, it depends on who's interviewing with me. A lot of times I'll have some other devs with me and I'll let them be the technician because they know the nuts and bolts of what project they're on and they need to know what specifically that candidate needs to know. I'll be the salesperson. I know the facts and numbers about VML. I can talk to what we're good at, you know, what, we're, what our clients are and what we can show off. That'll be me. So my hat can be switched during this whole process, but always have two people, at least in the interview, a salesperson and a technician. Um, what, yeah. What's like the max? 
Uh, <laughs> that's a good point. I work at a big company. Yeah. We have all these different groups, so we want, there's usually five, six people. Yeah. I'm, I don't, don't like going more than three because I really think it's up. How many of you here have been in an interview where you've had more than three people interview you? Yeah, it's not fun, is it? Because you kind of feel like you're on the board, like, they're, like they're, you're getting grilled. So my rule of thumb is two is very conversational. One person can throw out a fact, the other person can throw out a joke or something, and they kind of get a feel for the candidate, personality. You get three, it feels like one person has been like building up questions the whole time, and finally they get to him and he unloads on them. So I, my personal thought is I don't like doing three, but if it's needed, say I have a salesman, a technician, and I have a project manager or a technical director from the group that that person is going to go work for when they come on, I'll have them in because they want to get some maybe some personality check to see if they're a good fit for the team or not. So. I don't, three is, three is the max for me. I'm not, like, I can't decide how many people they just say, okay, we need this person. If, you're, if you have no control over that, I mean, you're kind of stuck with it, but I, if you have any, my thing is, I do enough of these. I can honestly say I've done over 40 interviews in the last year. So, like, that figures out, I don't know how many a month I can do a math, at least three a month, you know. So, I'm pretty familiar with it, so I don't need anybody else in there with me. I can do an interview by myself, but I like to, if you don't feel comfortable with you and another person, or if the company does, like, they have to have three. I can't really help you with your own like corporate policy there, but I would say two, two, three max. So, uh, last thing. This sounds really easy, but it's really easy to forget. Reserve a meeting room. Don't go around the last minute running around your office trying to find a spot when you just walk through the candidate through the front door, and you're trying to, hey, we can go sit. Oh, let's go over. That looks really unprofessional. Have a meeting room booked. Get the other person, the salesperson or technician, get them on the meeting invite so they're kind of aware that, oh, I have to block off my schedule for that day because I have an interview for an hour. Put the resume in there. Make sure they know this stuff. These are common things that I do all the time and it kind of makes the flow for an interview go, go a little bit faster. So, Because remember, a lot of us here are developers. We don't think this way. We're just like, oh, I got to interview somebody. We're very analytical when it comes to getting stuff done. You got to put your project management hat on a little bit and I've had to do that same thing throughout the years. Like I said, I'm a developer too. You guys got to remember this, but it helps out the interview process a lot if you streamline this. All right, this is the big one, selling your company. So I work for VML. It's an advertising agency based out of Kansas City. Yes, we drove three hours here this morning to come and talk at Bar Camp. So David Mitchell just gave a great talk on code reviews. He's from VML as well. We are one of the top 10 like, advertising agencies in North America. We work on awesome clients. We have Gatorade. We have like, Coors Light. We have, oh my gosh, I'm, there's so many I always forget. Are these clients or the fruit? Clients. And the beer. We have the beer on tap, too. We're an ad agency. So we have great things about our company. These are the things that you should be able to rattle off as soon as you go into an interview. Not necessarily say, hey, we have beer on tap. You don't want to think you're just like, you're back in college again. But the main thing is you want to show, this is why it's fun to work here. So selling your company is so key. And I, because I, I, like I said, I've had other candidates that leave because they got an offer from some other place. You know, you want them, when they leave your interview, you, they want to be like, wow. I get to go work for that company. And I know it sounds trivial, and I know, I, I, but I can't over, oversell this enough. Selling, haha. I can't oversell it. You guys need to make sure you sell your company because as much as it is about code and how smart they are, they're gonna go out to somebody else and be like, man, I didn't get that job at VML. I wasn't you know, smart enough or whatever they think, but man, I really do wanna work there. Their buddy hears that. Oh man, that VML place is a great place to go work for. You know, word of mouth gets out there. Like, you want people to come work for your company. So. Um, so a couple things, know your company information, know your facts, figures, not specific figures, at least get basic round numbers, you know, kind of like how many developers we have, so you can talk to that. Locations, like where we're located at, we're a global company, we have offices all over the, like all over the world, London, Australia, I mean, throw that stuff out, that's a big wow factor. I'm not saying like they're not going to be worried about tech stuff, but at the same time, throw that stuff out, it'll kind of, it'll, it'll be like, man, this is a pretty big place. Uh, be authentic. As developers, we kind of just kind of get into a routine. You know, you can just be like very monotone and not worry about this stuff. Be authentic when you're in an interview. Like, I mean, I don't think I need to talk too much on this, but there is a big personality thing when you're in interviews. Make sure, you, make sure you're authentic, you're genuine. Um, and so before we get into that, this is the last thing before we get into some tech stuff. Be a good host or hostess. Offer the person a glass of water. Sounds dumb. You know, give them a tour of the building. Like, this is key. We, ha we work in a great space. We work outside the old downtown, uh, we're actually in the old downtown airport in, uh, in Kansas City. So we have 747s land. Air Force One lands outside occasionally. The president gets off. This is key. Give them a tour. Show them this stuff. Once again, selling the company. No, it doesn't make much sense for developers sometimes, but it really does in the long run. When you try to get talent, little things like this, they're like, man, I work at a really cool place where I can wear shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops flip every day. You know, 
and we have people growing up, are growing up. Sorry, the time signal threw me off. We have people like working outside on the patio. They get together for like meetups and stuff here every Thursday and talk about stuff. You can work that in and show them how great of a place it is to work. All right, so let's get into questions. So, technical questions. First things, ask questions about their resume. These are some key things when you're looking for developers. Um, look where they worked last. Go through their history. What kind of stuff did it mean to you? I'm a front-end developer, so my main thing is I try to see what front-end like, tools they've used. Have they used Grunt? Have they used SAS? Are they familiar with any MVC framework? Do they know Angular? Do they know Ember? Like, try to get a gauge for these things. You know? And uh, you can kind of maybe pro uh, poke around a little bit and see what their level of Angular is. Maybe it's like, throw in a quick question. Do you know what scope is Angular? Can you explain scope to me in Angular? You know, they're kind of like, uh, maybe. You know, kind of get a gauge for that stuff. But go through their history. The other key thing is, like, if they have a lot of jumping around in their resume, and maybe you, some of you guys have jumped, jumping around in your resume, be uh, if you're interviewing someplace, be ready to explain that, because that's key. If I kind of see that you've hopped around in the last six months, I kind of want to know that because did you have a fallout with your old boss or not? So I need to ask that stuff because it's going to find out if this is a, if there's a good enough candidate for you if there are going to be some problems in the future. So look through the resume and ask some specific questions on the resume. Technical questions. This is where you guys probably light up the most because everyone's like, hey, I'm a dev. I want, I want to know X, Y, Z. Have a list of your questions. For me, front end stack is pretty simple. I ask them, do they have any kind of pre-compiler stuff or any uh, CSS pre-processing? Do they know SAS? Do they know less? You know, do they know stylus? If they have one of those, great. If you have one of those down, you're fine with the rest of them, personally, because it's all very similar. Someone might flame me after the fact and say they're not. But they're all, in my eyes, they're all very similar. Like, do they have an MVC framework that they know? Do they know Angular? Do they know, like, Ember? Do they know Backbone? If they know Backbone, I'll probably cringe, or, uh, I'll cringe a little bit, because we've had some problem with Backbone in the past. But do they know these other frameworks? Do they have responsive design? Do they know how to make a mobile site? Do they know, like, uh, responsive grid layouts? Do they know Suzy? How, like, ask them these questions. These are things that you can go off and they're just easy checkoffs. And you can kind of, by their answer themselves, you can tell how specific they know that language. Listen for key words. Like if you ask them what they like about, or you ask them about Angular, and they start going into, yeah, I love Angular because I love the way services and factories work because it cleans up my code so much. Oh, okay, check that off. They kind of know a little bit more than your base person does probably in Angular. So these are easy ways. These are like, kind of like softball questions you can kind of throw out and you can dig in more. When you get done with that, you have a list of things you still need to check off. All this stuff comes into play later because, I, like I said, this needs to be an equal playing ground amongst all the candidates that you do interview. You don't want to ask these questions to some people and not to the other person. It needs to be fair. That's the main thing to take away. Be fair. Have one large greenfield question. This one I think I've given to candidates before, and they kind of get this weird look on their face like, what are you asking me? And uh, I, I, get to, I get to give props to David Mitchell here because he's the one actually, I, I was in an interview with him. We were interviewing a candidate and he brought this up. Real quick, uh, the question is, uh, we, one of our clients is KCPNL out of Kansas City. So it's Kansas City Power and Light. So we say, Kansas City Power and Light, here's the question. They come to you and say, I want an app. And it's going to be called My Power is Out. Pretty simple. You go to a site, there's a big red button. You push that button, it tells them that their power is out. And it gives them some kind of notification back. So how would you build that? And they're like, I don't know. That, that's the beauty of the question. You start trying to get a feel for what they want to talk about. Do they want to talk about, well, uh, and, and I, I listen for key things. Do that, like for a web developer, like, well, if they say this probably should be a mobile site, it should because their power is going to be out. They're not going to have their computer working at home. So, okay, good. Common sense. They're thinking it should be a mobile site. Should be responsive. Okay, great. They're a ticked off customer because guess what? Their power is out. They don't have to put their address in. So if they do some kind of geolocation within the browser and HTML5 spec and they put that in automatically, that's one less thing you have to do. You just hit the button, let them know my power is out. So I like to see what they're thinking of. If they're more of a backend developer, because we do interviews, I'll sit in on some backend development. What do they want to do their backend in? Do they like Node? Do they want to do the backend in Node? Are they going to use Redis as far as the back? What else would they like? I don't know what kind of tracking. Have they tested it? Have they thought about, wow, this site's not going to get used a lot until the power goes out and you're going to have thousands of people hitting it. Have you did performance testing against it? These are all key things that you want to listen to. Give them this greenfield question. You're going to be surprised. A lot of them will freak out. Some will just, you'll, it's like a beautiful mind. You'll start seeing how they work all of a sudden and you can really see how a developer will think about this. And that will give you a good analysis if this person is going to be a good fit on your team or not. So greenfield questions are great. Very tech specific ones, sometimes fit the role, sometimes they don't. Real quick, on that last note, uh, tech-specific questions are very key for one reason. 
if you have a, I have a list of, and I can't remember if I'm covering that next slide or not. I have a list of tech specific questions like, uh, I'll go into some jQuery stuff. Like, do you know what chaining is in jQuery? Do you know what apply and call means in jQuery? Ask them these things, do they know the answer or not? Don't grill the person on it that much if they don't know. So when you're starting to ask, and this is kind of, and I think a lot of you guys in the room that have interviewed before kind of know what it's like when you're on the hot box. And man, you're just, you're blowing questions left and right. There's please stop. I don't want to answer any more of these questions. You understand that, that like, they may not know. Try to do like a binary search within your questions. If they can't answer X, Y, skip to like, you know, down here to the next level so they don't feel too bad. Make them comfortable. Once again, selling the company. Did they feel comfortable in the interview? Did they not? Did they feel like you just pestered them the whole time too? So, but the in individual questions inside of it are kind of key. Uh, I've also, David told me a good story a long time ago about a developer who felt like a, they gave them a name, uh, they called him Rain Man after the fact because all this developer knew was the exact answer to all the tech specific questions he gave them. And he kind of did this thing where he rolled his eyes back and said, ah, that's the answer, you know, and it was amazing. So they gave him the nickname Rain Man. So you don't want, I mean, so there's some, there's some things you'll learn and you, I mean, I poke fun at it a little bit, but if they just only answer tech specific questions but they don't have a good feel for the rest of the company or personality, that's one thing. But the other thing is, if this guy is bombing a lot of like other small things, like, oh, okay, they really don't know SAS, they really don't know MVC frameworks. They really don't know, like, I mean, I don't know. They don't know Grunt. They don't know how to do any kind of, like, continuous integration at all. Oh, man, I don't think we want to hire him. I had that a while back. And then all of a sudden, I was like, let me go through my list of tech-specific questions here. You know, define scope, define variables, apply, call, and apply. Can you see what that is? Like, just, he was just, like, this, this guy could just answer him just, like, really quick. But it wasn't, like, the Rain Man thing. He actually could explain it really well. I'm like... Okay, that totally altered like my whole perception of this developer just with a few key questions. So, and uh, I know David's mentioned you've interviewed a guy a long time ago that actually he wasn't even interviewing for a testing position at all at VML, but he came in as a developer and he was not doing so well on the, all the development questions that were getting thrown at him. But I'll tell you what, as soon as he started bringing out like, well, do you test your apps? He's like, oh, I love testing. This is how I test my apps. This is how I would test this. Like, okay, well, how would you test this site? Oh, I would do this, 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 this. Amazing. So, you never know that person coming in to interview for a certain position at your company might not be the interview might not be the position he gets hired on as. So keep your questions open. The greenfield stuff definitely helps out. You can find out a lot about a candidate. He might fit a better position that you thought of. Um, we like to finish most of our questions with this one. It's like find out what inspires them to be better at their craft. Like you as a developer, like you constantly try to sharpen the saw, right? You wouldn't be at a conference on a Saturday morning, like for us three hours away, unless you didn't worry about your craft. So ask them those questions. How do you learn? Like, what inspires you? What websites do you go to? What podcasts do you listen to? Like, what do you read? What, what makes you a better developer? Find out these things because this is key. If they don't really follow anything or they don't have much motivation to look at this kind of stuff, I don't know. Are they going to be continually learning outside of your work? Because you, you, you guys know what it's like. You're on a hot project. You don't get to learn too much at work. You got to kind of like, what's, what's the phrase? Like, drop... Uh, Running to, I can't remember, Jump, running to catch up with the train? I'm blanking, <laughs> whatever the phrase is. They gotta start running, whatever it is. 10 points for doing this during a talk. Um, so find out like, if they're gonna be able to learn on the fly because, and what they do outside of work, because that's key. If they, you see someone who's not interested in learning at all, that's big, that's big in my eyes, because that means they're just gonna come and work a nine to five every day, and they're not gonna wanna push themselves. So, um, let's see, last thing. And finally, let them ask questions. I save 10 minutes at the end of the interview to let them ask whatever questions I have. As I said, we are an advertising agency, so we actually do a lot of contracting that comes in, so we don't do a direct hires. 99.9% .9 of our hires at VML have come through contracting. Very seldom is it a direct hire. A lot of people are scared about contracting, but honestly, I was a contractor. David was a contractor when he came on. So, sorry, I keep pointing at David throughout this whole presentation. He was a contractor. We're all very familiar with it, and there's no difference between a contractor and a full-time and our job. So explain that stuff to them. If they have questions about it, be free to talk about it. If they're not asking you any questions, and you know there's some hot button stuff inside your head that they might want to know eventually, Throw out some ideas. Get them talking. You learn a lot from what they can ask you. And they'll, I mean, they'll get some key information. Maybe it's not a good fit for them before the contracting thing. So make sure you leave 10 minutes to ask them questions. Post interview. This is important. And I can't stress how important this is because we're all very busy. How many people here are busy at their job? You people who didn't raise your hand? You need to start looking for more work. I think the key thing, the key thing is we're all busy and you have no time to remember the interview that you did two days ago. Like when you interview one candidate and you're like, okay, great. Uh, he was good at these three things. Next day, next candidate. Uh, 
Yeah, he's good. What was what was the other guy? What was he good at? What? Oh yeah, I think he I think he knew that. I think yeah. a lot of people just kind of loosey goosey, just go about their day, not worrying about the last person interview. They just like they, I got a feel for him. I think he was pretty good. Next guy comes in, and now you're up in the air. You have no clue who to choose. So, the the, the biggest nerdest nerdiest thing I do is <laughs> everyone's gonna hate this. Rank your candidates against basic uh, specific criteria elements. Have a list of them. Here are some of the basic ones I list against. I won't get into them, but these are great. Ability, manageability, willingness, adaptability, critical thinking, conciseness, attention to detail. These are very general. Rank them one to seven. So you can at least say, oh, this guy's got some good critical thinking. Rank them. So the next day when you look at somebody else, you know, both of you guys that were in the interview, do this process and kind of average out. Well, I think he's this, I think he's this. Kind of come up with an average for that person, rank up. The next person that comes in. So when you got four or five people you interviewed all week and you have to make a decision at the end of the week, you kind of have some numbers to it. So you're not kind of doing the wet finger in the air. Ah, he's okay. You know, or I think it's this person. I know it's weird and we hate putting numbers assigned to people because we think that's a bad thing. Reality is you got to start doing it a little bit because it's going to make some things organized just a little bit better in your life. So, and last thing, I know we're getting close on time, is follow up. We work with contracting firms. That person who just interviewed is waiting to get a job. They want to know how they did. So uh, the biggest thing I try to do is follow up with the contracting firm. Okay, yeah, we like this person. We didn't like this person. We didn't like this person. Why? X, Y, Z. Give them feedback. They're never going to grow unless you give them feedback. You have to let them know because if they interviewed poorly and you never tell why, they're going to have a hard time getting a job someplace else or know what to study up on. The common thing I do for a follow-up is that immediately when the interview's over and I'm kind of giving a tour of EML and I'm walking them out the door, um, I say, hey, it was nice to meet you. And even if I know they're not going to get it, they're going to get the job, uh, I say, hey, a couple things you're going to want to work on. Like you said you didn't know any MVC practices at all or MVC things at all for client side. Might want to start looking at Angular. Might want to get pretty familiar with it. It's going to be pretty big. You might want to start looking at SAS and stuff if you haven't done CSS, like any like pre-compilers for CSS. You know, walk them through that. This is key. Make them, because that's another thing. You just sold your, being nice, you just sold your company again. Like, man, that place was great. They told me what I should work on. How many people have left an interview and didn't get any feedback about what they should be doing on their career to get a job? Anybody raise their hands? Yeah, a lot of you guys. So that's key. That's another way to sell your company. Make sure you do that. Give good feedback. Give great feedback. If you thought they did a great job at the interview, tell them, like, man, I think you're a great candidate. We've got to work through some details with a contracting firm, but I think you're a solid fit for VML. You know, we like to bring you on. We're going to work out some details. So be sure to communicate to them well so they feel good coming out of it. The more I do that, the more thank you notes and stuff I get back afterwards. I start, I've been getting more thank yous lately, which is great to come and say, hey, you did a, I want to come to your company so bad. Thanks so much. That's good to hear. That makes you know you're doing a good job. So. That's it. Any questions? We got like two minutes left. I can't You're, relate. Do you guys check their Stack Overflow rating? Check our Stack Overflow? Our stack overflow um, I don't get into that too much, really. I mean, I'll look. If we got time, I'll look at it, really. But that's a good thing to do, like if you want to. Phone interviews. Do you value in-person over that? Uh, I value in-person over phone interviews as much as possible. If they can't do an in-person interview, I try to do a Google Hangout. That's the next thing video. I like to do, a video thing. If they can't do that, I do a phone interview. Uh, general interviews I like to keep to an hour. Phone interviews I try to keep to 30 minutes because you'll be surprised if you're only on the phone. You don't have much to talk about after 30 minutes. But hangouts, hangouts are nice to go with too. How much stock did you put in? There were a smart person. They don't know the technology, but they probably learned it. Yeah. Do you think that is true? Sure. I think it's great. If they have like the ability to learn on the fly and you can gauge that from the interview, that's solid. I mean, and you know if your company's got like has the flexibility to work with them to get them better, oh, that's better. Uh, let's take them on. I've taken on people because they're super bright and you know they don't know these one or two key things. They can learn it. And like I said, usually it's a two-week difference between when they are gonna like accept the job between they came on. That's two weeks in the front end world, that's an eternity. You can learn so much in two weeks' time. You can learn any framework in two weeks. You can learn SAS, you can learn anything. Give them two weeks to get caught up, they'll know a lot when they come into the door. So I think that's it. So thanks.